start now with our seminar. Today uh, we'll have Simon who's going to explain to us uh, all the work that uh, we're doing in the research platforms. Uh, so Simon has been working at CIMIT for about three years, coordinating uh, the platform research. And before that, he did his PhD at the University of Ghent about uh, cold tolerance um, or cold stress tolerance in miscanthus. Um, so if you ever need any advice on biofuel <laughs> crops and cold stress, he's also your man. So I'll leave Simon to explain everything about platforms. Thank you. So, as you can see from the first slide, I will present this presentation, but it's uh, composed of the work of a lot of collaborators. Um, and I'm coordinating their work, but it's not all my own work. So to start, why do we need research platforms? So, as scientists, we have a lot of um, data, we have a lot of experience on how to improve agricultural systems with conservation agriculture, improved varieties, uh, fertilization mechanization, things like that. But still, lots of farmers are struggling with problems like low yields, soil degradation, high input costs, uh, climate change. So we have to make sure that the science that we are doing really benefits the farmers. But how? Can we make sure that the work we're doing in our research st uh, stations also is applicable for the farmers and can help them? That's why we are working with the um, hub concept. So the hub concept, this is a theoretical um, depiction of the hub concept, exists uh, in three components. So there's um, research platforms, which are agronomical trials. There's modulos, which are side-by-side uh, -side comparisons in farmers' fields, and there's extension areas, which are fields where um, innovative farmers are applying the technologies that we are promoting. So what is the difference between all these components? So a platform is really a trial. The focus will be on the research and technology development. We will try to find solutions for problems from farmers that come up in modulos or areas de extension or directly from them. We will evaluate several treatments and we will try to improve the um, local production system. So we will be working on an experimental scale, so smaller plots than complete fields. And we can also try out new stuff. So we can do what we call high risk options where we can implement new treatments that we don't know that will work, but um, since it's a scientific trial, we can take the risk. And the modules, the focus is not on research, but on the application of already proven technologies. So we will compare the best treatment uh, from the platform, best, uh, that will depend on what the farmer likes best, not on what has the highest yield, uh, with the conventional practice. And the modules, since we will be working on a experimental scale, uh, on a field scale, and farmers' fields, new problems will come up that we then can try to solve in the research platforms. The modulos will also be on field scale, so not experimental plots, but large-scale demonstrations so the farmers can see that the things work in their own uh, conditions. And the modulos, we will work with low-risk options because we are working in the farmers' field with the farmers' uh, resources, so we cannot um, risk crop failure. Then, we have the extension areas. Extension areas, we only we treat the whole field the same, and we work with innovative farmers with the idea that they will then promote these technologies to their um, peers. And we also have a register of impact areas, which are all the fields where the promoted technologies and the previous three components are applied. So that's the theory, but how do we get to the practice? So a research platform is not just a trial where a scientist thinks of uh, new research and it puts it into the field. There's more to it than that. First, we need to have a strategic need in the hub for a platform. For example, there can be areas in the hub where we are working in a system that we don't know or where the next platform is so far away that uh, local farmers can never visit it. 
So then the hub manager will indicate uh, that we need a platform there. The next step, and most important step, will be to find a suitable collaborator. So most of the platforms are not run by CIMIT, they are run by national research institutes like INIFAP, by uh, dispatches of extensionists, by universities, schools, or even by farmers' organizations that want to improve their local production system. Once we have a suitable collaborator, we will have a meeting with all the local actors, so farmers, technicals, uh, other people that want to be involved, and we will make a diagnostic of the local production system. So first, we want to know what is the local production system, so we can base the research that we will be doing on what the farmers are already doing, so nothing that we will do will be impossible for them to implement. We will um, identify the main problems they are struggling with, and identify which ones we can solve. The main problem they always indicate first is that they don't get paid enough for their harvest, but we cannot solve that. But we can um, solve problems of low yields, of um, bad fertilization, pest problems, those things we can uh, research. And now we will identify possible solutions. And these possible solutions will then be the treatments that we can evaluate in the platform. So once we have thought of these possible solutions that we could um, implement in the area, we will design the platform. In general, we will have a long-term trial, a main trial, where we will do investigation into practices that show their results on the long term, such as conservation agriculture, for example. We will have one treatment in this trial that will be the control, it will be the representation of the um, of the local production system. So it will be conventional practice. And then we will have other treatments that are representations of possible improved production systems. So systems, we're not uh, working with full factorial um, designs, but we are evaluating different systems. And we'll offer a range of different um, possibilities. So we don't have one solution, we offer 10, 20, depends on the collaborator, different um, production systems that go from conventional to a completely sustainable system. So the farmers that visit the platform, they can see that there are different options they could implement. We also have um, often on the site some short-term site trials where we can evaluate things that don't need a long-term investigation. Um, things like varieties, fertilization, herbicides, alternative crops, things that in one, two, three cycles you have a definitive, uh, definitive answer on. So of course, in theory there's the hub, uh, in the graphic there's the hub uh, with one platform, one module, one uh, extension area, but in practice um, we have of course several uh, platforms in each hub because we try to have a platform for every different agroecological system. So here on the map you can see the 12 hubs in Mexico, and you can see that most of the hubs have several platforms that work in collaboration to improve the production system. You can also see that we have uh, implemented platforms not only in Masagro, but also in the other projects. We're always trying to implement the same strategy so we can um, have them work together. So this, is, this was the theory on what are research platforms and how do we um, implement them. But what are the results that we have um, observed so far in these platforms? So to start, the things that we have been researching in the platforms are very diverse. So they depend on what the farmers and local technicians indicate as the problems and they depend on what is applicable in the local conditions. So we do research on tillage, soil cover, uh, crop diversification, fertilization, varieties, water use, agroecological management, plant arrangement. It will depend very much on the conditions. And of these uh, different uh, treatments, we'll always try to um, gather the same kind of data. So always we'll collect 
yield and biomass data. We'll have data on the field operations and how much they cost. The costs, uh, not in the station, but the costs that, would, uh, that the farmer would pay. Plant height, emergence, flowering date, maturity date. The standard um, agronomical trial uh, data. And then depending on the situation, or the collaborator or the exact research question they want to solve, we'll um, gather some more data like thousand kernel weight, grain quality, disease, pest or wheat incidents or soil quality. Those we don't always stick, but that can depend on the circumstances. The basis of our research generally will be conservation agriculture. So conservation agriculture defined as um, the production system based on minimal soil movement, so avoiding plowing, permanent soil cover with crops or with residues, and crop diversification. So not growing a monoculture of one crop, but trying to grow rotations or diverse mixtures. Why conservation agriculture? Because we and many others have um, demonstrated that conservation agriculture can help reduce production costs, can improve soil quality, and can improve um, crop yields, especially under rain-fed conditions. I think a lot of you have already seen this picture taken in 2009 here in Texcoco, where in a, in a dry year, the conventional system on the right suffered a lot from drought stress, while the conservation agriculture on the, oh well, my left, um, had residue cover, and more organic matter, leading it to retain more moisture and suffer much less from um, water stress, leading to a large difference in yield. Now, the interesting thing from the research platforms is that we can also observe the same things in other regions. For example, this is a, a picture from this year from Peto and Yucatan. It's a traditional milpa system, but also there, when we um, stop burning, and have a residue cover, we see large differences in plant development and yield. Similarly, in Chiapas, where there's a drought this year, we see that conservation agriculture helps the plants um, access more moisture. It's not only under rain-fed conditions that conservation agriculture can help. In this trial in San Luis Potosí, Conservation agriculture has improved dramatically the um, soil quality and the infiltration rate. So on the left, in conservation agriculture, water easily infiltrates, while on the right, it can take up to four days for it to infiltrate, which of course leads to a much better plant development in conservation agriculture than in the conventional system. We have now about 60 research platforms, so that's too much to go into detail um, on the results of every uh, platform. But I've selected um, some graphs of four platforms to show what kind of results we are getting from the main trials. So the first one is pretty straightforward, Molkahak and Puebla. The red line is the conventional system, which is limited by terminal drought, so they get about 800 kilograms of maize every year. If you then go to the green line, which is uh, permanent beds, so no tillage and residue cover, we can already improve yields. If we then also include um, crop rotation with beans, so that's the blue line, that's full conservation agriculture, we can more than double the yields. Similar uh, results we obtained in San Juan del Rio, where you can see that uh, the blue lines, or conservation agriculture, yield substantially more than uh, the conventional system. But it's not always that straightforward. For example, in Soledad de Graciano Sanchez, in the bottom left, in the first decade of the trial, we didn't see much difference between the, um, uh, the treatments, because uh, we were working with a very old hybrid. But then, when we uh, switched to a newer hybrid with a larger, uh, higher yield potential, this hybrid could take advantage of the improved conditions in the soil and obtain a much higher yield. In our own research station in Tlaltizapan and Morelos, 
We haven't seen any consistent effects of conservation agriculture so far, but we have been able to um, more than double the yields in the eight years of the trial. We're not only investigating um, conservation agriculture, as I said, we also have some site trials where we evaluate other things. For example, in Wasabe and Sinaloa, we are uh, evaluating the green seeker together with Ivan's team, where the conventional practice is supplying about 360 units of nitrogen per hectare, while with the green seeker, we only had to apply 200, while we uh, had exactly the same yield in conventional or in permanent beds. We're also looking at other ways to improve fertilization. For example, in Chiapas, we had a trial with three different cover crops, so common beans in blue, uh, dolicos in orange, and um, cannavalia in green, with three different levels of um, nitrogen. So we then evaluated what is the effect of uh, having a cover crop for crop diversification on yield, and the results are quite promising, showing us that we could substantially reduce uh, fertilization if we include cover crops in Via Corso in Chapos. We're, of course, not only looking at yield, yield is not everything, we're also looking at the production costs. So, it's not working. So, for every uh, treatment, we'll have a register of all the production costs. The costs as they would be for farmers, not the on-station costs. In order to then, with the yields and the prices of the crops, determine which crops are the, uh, which treatments are the most profitable. And then, if this indicates that our treatments are not very profitable, we have to adapt them so to make them profitable for the farmers. For example, in Ocampo, when we analyzed our, um, our data, we saw that the costs of weed control were way too high. So this year we switched to mechanical um, weed control, as you can see in the picture, and we drastically reduced our um, expenses on herbicides based on this data. So of course, we have 60 platforms, that's way too much to uh, discuss each individually, especially if you also look at the site trials. But we can also put together the data to get some general impression of the results we are obtaining. If we look at maize yield, for example, we can see here the difference in yield and kilograms per hectare between the conventional and the best conservation agriculture treatment in each platform. And we see that, in general, conservation agriculture yields higher and it increases over time. Sometimes it's said that in the first years of conservation, of conversion to conservation agriculture, there's a substantial drop in yield. However, we have not seen that often in our uh, platforms. Of course, there is a huge variation um, between all our uh, platforms. We have yields from one ton per hectare to 20 ton per hectare. So it might be better to look at it as a percentage yield increase. So if we compare conventional and conservation agriculture treatments in our um, platforms, we tend to get about 30 to 40 percent yield increase if we um, implement conservation agriculture or uh, other improved technologies. We can also look at the um, average cost structure of our treatments. So on the left, um, we see the costs um, for irrigated wheat and irrigated maize and rain-fed wheat and, uh, and rain-fed maize both uh, absolute and um, as percentage. So this data indicates us that, for example, fertilization is a huge part of our costs, so we have to work on reducing fertilization costs. Weed management can be a high cost, so we have to work on reducing that. And even harvesting, especially for maize, which is generally harvested by hand in most areas, is a huge cost. Um, up to 20% of the total production cost. 
So we have to work on um, methods to reduce this, this cost. So not only focus on tillage, but focus on the whole production system. We can also analyze the relation between production costs in our treatments and yields. So in the one graph, we can see that with a higher production cost, we have a higher yield, which is nice. But then if we look at the other graph, we see the net profit in relation to um, production cost. And we see that there's basically no relation between the costs of our treatments and the profit we gain from them. So this indicates us that we shouldn't be focusing on applying more or better inputs, but we have to focus on improving management. For example, you can have the same production cost, but you can have had a rotation with, um, with beans the year before, so you can have one or two tons more yield with exactly the same cost. We can also look at um, other aspects of agriculture in our uh, trials, and we can put together data from several trials, some from several platforms, to get an overall impression of the effects of conservation agriculture. For example, if we look at um, the weed biomass per treatment, so in red we have the um, conventional treatments, and in blue we have the conservation agriculture treatments, we see that well, these platforms, they've had about three or more cycles already. So we see that in the um, medium to long term, weed biomass is reduced uh, with conservation agriculture, which can help us to reduce also our um, costs of weed management. We're also working on uh, pest management in the platforms. We are not doing new research, but we are mostly implementing uh, practices that have been proven in other, um, in other areas. For example, uh, we're working a lot with the uh, pheromone traps. We have them almost in every platform now. In the bottom graph, you can see the capture of um, male moths in Inda Parapeo in Michoacan. We've got captures of more than 100 moths per um, for three days in this uh, trial. If you know that every mod can potentially uh, fertilize three females, which can each uh, lay about 200 eggs, this is a giant quantity of, um, of caterpillars that we have avoided, which helps us to reduce ins insecticide use to one or two applications per cycle. We started studying also the effects of conservation agriculture on, for example, the incidence of pests. On the upper graph, you can see in red the amount of herbivorous insects this summer in uh, conventional agriculture in D5 here in Texcoco. And in blue, the number of herbivorous insects in conservation agriculture, which was a bit lower. Not by much, but it's a nice result. The platforms, they also allow us to um, study general trends on soil quality. We've had a lot of data on soil quality from Texcoco and from Obregón, but the country is very, very diverse in soils and climates, everything. So the platforms help us to get a broader picture of what are the effects of the practices that we are promoting on soil quality. So last year we did soil sampling in 20 of the platforms in the um, center and the south, and we did um, the Fertilab soil analysis on them. So if you look at the results, in conservation agriculture we see a significant increase in organic matter in the, um, zero to five centimeter, the upper layer of the soil, and about the same organic matter in the five to 30 centimeter layer. Of course, the more organic matter we have in our soil, the more fertile it is, the more water it can retain. So this will help us obtain uh, better crop yields. If we look at macronutrients, we saw that uh, nitrogen was much higher in the zero to five centimeter layer uh, in conservation agriculture compared to conventional agriculture. 
while um, in the 5 to 30 centimeter layer there was no difference. For potassium and phosphorus we saw a slight increase in um, and conservation agriculture in the five to uh, in zero to five centimeter layer, but the effect was not as strong as for nitrogen. This is a graph of the um, pH in the platforms we measured. So it's sometimes uh, said that if you retain more residues, this will acidify the soil, uh, which can be both positive and negative depending on your soil. Uh, pH. So you can see we're working in all different kinds of soils, going from acid soils of pH of 5 to basic soils of a pH of 8. But we don't really see a, um, a change in pH if we change from conventional agriculture to conservation agriculture. Another aspect that we could study, thanks to the platforms, was the effect of conservation agriculture on grain quality. So we have observed sometimes that grain protein content uh, can be lower in conservation agriculture compared to tillage systems. However, most data that we have ab uh, available comes from our own trials. Um, we have more data from uh, wheat than from maize. And we have mostly data from Ciudad Obregón and Texcoco. Explanations for this lower content could be um, a dilution effect. For example, if you have the same amount of nitrogen applied, but we have a higher yield, there will be less nitrogen per grain. Or there could also be some effects on uh, nitrogen cycling in the soil that we don't really understand yet. So last year, we took uh, grain samples and all the platforms with wheat uh, in the center, which are not much, uh, we only had four. But in these platforms, we did not see any difference in uh, wheat protein content between conventional conservation agriculture. For maize, we had a larger sample. We have much more platforms with maize than with wheat. So we had few, uh, 432 samples from 25 different platforms. But a quick analysis, we have not analyzed this data into detail yet, but a quick analysis does also not show any differences with um, between varieties, between the level of residues or between the tillage and the protein content of maize. <coughs> An interesting um, change in how we are measuring uh, effects of, of the treatments in our platforms is that we are also starting to um, have collaboration with outside institutes. For example, this year we had a collaboration with the uh, Soil Health Institute from the United States. And they included 15 of our platforms in the North American project to evaluate soil health measurements, which is a project that will sample, of have sa has sampled, 120 long-term trials across the whole continent, um, analyzed it for 30 different soil parameters in order to find which practices are improving soil health and what are the best ways to measure and determine it. So we'll have the results, uh, the full results by early 2020, which will uh, probably uh, teach us a lot on the effects of our practices. We have some interesting results already. For example, on the graphs below, we have the infiltration rate in three different platforms. So what we've generally seen is that we have a higher infiltration rate with conservation agric agriculture because of um, better soil structure, more organic matter, so we have a higher infiltration rate. That's what we saw in the first two platforms, but then in the platform in Iropuato, uh, the red bar on, um, we saw that the red bar, the conventional uh, treatment, had a much higher infiltration rate than conservation agriculture, so we don't know yet why, but this opens up new areas where we need to do more research. So, to conclude this presentation, in the research platforms, we study and demonstrate how to adapt sustainable intensification practices to the farmer's local conditions. So, the things that we do will depend very much on the local conditions. We try to offer farmers a range of different options 
in different treatments, so we don't have one solution to solve everything. We offer them um, a menu, we call it, of different options they could apply in their farms in order to improve their production. In all regions where we've been working so far, we have been able to improve yields or profitability while reducing production costs and the environmental impacts. And finally, the platforms, they offer an opportunity to study the effects of sustainable intensification across a wide range of agricultural conditions. So thank you for your interest. If you have any questions, feel free to ask. of insect in conventional practices in comparison with uh, conservation agriculture? No, um, we, we had more insects on the plants in uh, conventional agriculture, agriculture yes. um, which might be due to maybe less predators. Uh, if we do tillage, we kill the pres uh, predators. The pheromone traps, they work on a large scale, so... Um, Every pheromone has about uh, a radius of 50 meters where it attracts um, males, so we cannot apply them on plots and on smaller plots, so they <laughs> capture everything at once. Okay, thank you. Yeah, actually. Um, pheromone traps were first tried out in modules and extension areas and then were implemented in the platforms once we saw that they were working. So that's something that we first tried on a large scale and then implemented um, when we saw on a practical scale that it was working. Yeah, you, you can see that there's less damage on the plants that you have to apply less. So in a lot of areas, they are used to applying five, six times insecticides. And then with um, traps, you can reduce this to one or two applications. Unfortunately, uh, we don't have that. We only have it for D5 here in Texcoco. We can, we have done um, soil tests at uh, several different platforms. If we put them together, we basically see that with conservation agriculture, we get a slight increase in organic matter, but we have more dramatically a um, a larger increase, uh, a larger decrease in organic matter in conventional agriculture. So we see more organic matter in conservation agriculture, but it's not only because we are uh, capturing carbon, it's also because uh, we're getting a bigger difference because we're losing carbon in conventional agriculture. Yeah, that's uh, quite a common treatment. So often, in many regions, fertilization is based on a very old recommendation or on what is available, but not on what the plants or the soil really needs. So often one of the first treatments we have is just conventional agriculture, but then with um, a fertilization based on what the plant needs, uh, which can often um, drastically improve the, the yields.
quantity of organic matter, so maybe this will, uh, if we're doing rot rotation, for example, this will bring us to decrease the amount of nitrogen that we are using. I mean, this kind of treatment in, in lab. Mm -hmm. This is one of the things we want to start doing more. So up to now, we've been focusing a lot on the, the basics, just rotation, just um, uh, tillage or no tillage, residues or no residues, and then keeping the rest of the management, fertilization, um, weed uh, management, pest control, the same. But now we are seeing, for example, differences in soil fertility. We're seeing differences in weeds. So we're, um, we want to work more on adapting the whole system to um, the whole system, not just uh, aspects of it, because we see that it, it can be possible to do that. But we don't have much research on that yet. Uh, I thought the green seeker would help. Uh, yes, the green seeker could help us with that, but we haven't done it yet. Okay. So if there's no more questions, I thank you for your attention. Thank you.